We are currently studying Paul's letter to the Romans and we've reached the second chapter from the first verse. And Paul now turns aside from the first man he's been considering in chapter 1 to the second man. And this study of the second man takes up the first 16 verses of uh, chapter 2. And this second man is the moralist. And he is now sitting in judgment on the immoral man of the first chapter. And so here in chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul addresses himself to this moralist. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, whoever you are, when you judge another. For in passing judgment upon him, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who do such things. The sins of chapter 1. But do you suppose, O oh man, that when you judge those who do such things and yet you do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume upon, do you take for granted the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But by your hard and impenitent heart, you, the moralist, are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment on the immoral and the moral will be revealed. For God will render to every man according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, God will give eternal life. <clears throat> but to those who are uh, contrary, factious, and do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness. There will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. To the Jew first, the religious man, and also to the Greek, the irreligious man. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good the Jew first, the religious man, and also the Greek, the irreligious man. For God shows no partiality. There's no favoritism with God. All who have sinned outside the Ten Commandments will also perish outside the Ten Commandments. And all who have sinned under the Ten Commandments will be judged by the Ten Commandments. For it is not the hearers of the commandments who are righteous before God, but the doers of the commandments who will be justified. When Gentiles, the pagan, godless outsiders, who do not have the commandments, do by nature what the commandment requires, they are a commandment to themselves, even though 
They do not have the commandment. They show, these godless outsiders, that what the commandment requires is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse their actions on the day when, <clears throat> according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word and grant us an understanding of it. It is important to see that in this uh, section of the letter to the Romans, Paul is holding up three men for our study and examination. What he is uh, trying to show, and uh, he comes to that conclusion in chapter 3, is um, something that we take for granted after 19 centuries of uh, Christian teaching, namely the universality of sin. All men are sinners in the sight of the living God. Now, of course, sins may vary from person to person. Some sins are more outrageous and uh, noticeable than others, and uh, some sins are more quiet and uh, secret than others. But Paul's final verdict in chapter 3 is that all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who does good perfectly, no, not one, that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world be held guilty before God. And that is Paul's conclusion to the argument. But in order to reach that conclusion, in the first two chapters of Romans, he sets up these three men. And uh, <clears throat> we mustn't imagine that these three men are just Aunt Sally's or uh, cardboard figures that you set up for the sake of argument just to knock them down. These three men are real men and they are very much alive today. The first man whom we looked at last week is the irreligious man who lives a thoroughly immoral life. And Paul says in chapter 1 that the tragedy of this man is that God has spoken to him in the works of creation. When the irreligious man looks at the universe and the suns and the moons and the stars of space and the planets and the trees and the flowers, he ought to see God and he ought to hear God speaking to him. But instead, and this is his tragedy, he turns away from the God of creation and starts worshipping things and surrounding himself with things and trusting in things. And the Bible name for that is idolatry. And the further tragedy of this first man is that idolatry sooner or later leads to immorality. And so you get the catalogue of vices and unnatural behavior 
from uh, verse 26 of Romans 1 onwards. Verses um, 26 and 27 speaking about um, sexual deviations, about uh, lesbianism and uh, homosexuality. And moving from those sins of the flesh down to the sins of the spirit, the worst sins, from verse 29 onwards. And uh, the final verdict on this first man is found in the last verse of chapter 1. Although they know God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they approve those who practice them. And so at the start of this uh, second chapter, Paul now turns to the second man. Like the first man, he is irreligious. But unlike the first man, he lives a moral life. He lives a straight, clean life, but without religion. Uh, I wonder if you can uh, cast your minds back, I think some of you can, to some uh, 25 years ago to the Christian scene in Scotland in those days. And uh, you may recall that a fierce controversy raged in the press at the time. Billy Graham had come and gone in the Tell Scotland Crusade. And religion was in the air 25 years ago. Some Christians thought there might even be a revival and people were prepared to speak about religious issues more freely than they are today. And uh, the result was that the humanists were provoked to come out into the open and to challenge some of the presuppositions that the Christians were uh, taking for granted. And these uh, humanists it were led, first of all, by Rex Knight, the professor of uh, psychology at Aberdeen University, and his wife, Margaret Knight, who was a leader of the atheists and the humanists in those days. And uh, the question that rose to the surface was this, and it was all over the place in the press. Can you be good without being religious. And of course you can. There are many good atheists and there are many upright humanists. People like um, Professor Ayers and uh, Professor Anthony Flew and uh, Marganita Lasky. And uh, their great slogan of the day was Morals without religion. You can be good without religion. And you can be good without Jesus. And that's the sort of man Paul is portraying here in uh, chapter 2 of Romans. He is an irreligious man, and he's a godless man, but he is an upright man. And I may say, he is uh, very well known in today's post-Christian society. I'm sure you may have met um, some of the folk Paul has in mind here it may well be that this man lives in your street. Perhaps he lives next door to you. Perhaps you are 
this man. He doesn't have a great deal of time for God and religion as such. Oh, he may switch on uh, songs of praise occasionally or uh, reflections just for the sake of uh, a little uplift. Religion on the cheap, you know. A hand doesn't come out of the television screen with a collection bag. TV religion is cheap religion. The man may have no particular interest in Jesus Christ or in the works of Christ, and yet it would be very hard to fault him morally and ethically because he may well have high moral standards. He can be a splendid neighbor. He can be honest and truthful to a degree. He never lands in trouble with the police. He's not likely to land in jail. His uh, children are well brought up and cared for. He honors and respects the marriage bond. He doesn't squander his money foolishly or irresponsibly. He pays his debts and his taxes on the nail. And he lives a life of moral rectitude. And you must now imagine this man sitting in judgment on the first man, criticizing him for his uh, drunkenness and his adultery and his degraded lifestyle. It's a great weakness in human nature, you know, <clears throat> that the moral sit in judgment on the immoral. And uh, people who are self-righteous, by which I mean people whose righteousness comes from themselves rather than from God, the self-righteous do tend to criticize and look down their noses at the immoral. And so here is this moral man sitting in judgment on the immoral man and Paul turns to him and says, You have no excuse, O oh man, whoever you are, when you judge another, for in passing judgment upon him, you condemn yourselves. Because you, the judge, are doing the same things. In other words, the judge is now in the dock alongside the man he has just condemned. Because both the judge and the prisoner are guilty in the sight of God. Because the judge, the moral man, is doing the same things as the man on whom he sits in judgment. That's what Paul says. The same things. What can that mean? Well, the reference here is to what I sometimes call the higher morality of Jesus, which is a morality that takes in not simply wrong actions, but the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You see, Jesus teaches that in order to sin, it isn't necessarily simply to sin. Jesus teaches that if you think the sin, it's the same as doing it. Listen to these familiar words from Matthew chapter 5. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, You've heard that it was said to the men of old, You shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, 
that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. In other words, anger is murder. If you hate your brother, you have killed your brother. Jesus says, it is enough to think it. And that's the action. Or uh, later on in Matthew 5 again, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The higher morality of Jesus. And uh, I um, sometimes call this um, mental indulgence. That's to say, allowing in our heads things that we would not allow in our lives. Let me give you three illustrations of mental indulgence. Uh, I have a brother, Bill, who lives in uh, Peterhead, and he works on the North Sea rigs with uh, a French film, Total, which uh, takes up North Sea gas and it feeds it into the national gas grid. And uh, my brother was telling me how appalled he is by the dreadful videos that men watch in their off time in the Riggs cinema. Sleazy blue movies that degrade men and women, and uh, reduce men and women who are made in the image of God to the level of erotic objects. And yet, he says, the vast majority of these men are happily married men and would never dream of violating the bonds of marriage. Now, you see... That is mental indulgence. Allowing with your head what you would not allow with your life. Here's a a second example, a a, a more light-hearted example. I was um, in a friend's home recently where the husband and wife are both uh, teetotalers. Neither of them drinks alcohol, just as a matter of principle. And the husband was uh, laying forth one evening about uh, the demerits of the license trade and all the damage and the ruin that drink is causing and the proliferation of the granting of licenses throughout the town. And his wife turned to him and said, you old hypocrite, sitting in judgment of people who drink alcohol, and you are a coffee addict. And he is indeed, because a cup of coffee is rarely out of his hand, and the percolator goes day and night, and coffee is an addiction, and it's a drug. And yet he condemns the one while he indulges the other. And that is mental indulgence. Allowing with your head what you would not allow in your life. And here's a third and a more serious example. We hear a great deal of condemnation these days about the various uh, dangerous drugs that uh, people take, right up to the hard stuff. But uh, what interests me is this that uh, many of those who crusade against uh, narcotics and uh, hallucinogenic drugs, and of course I would be the first to crusade against them, but many of the crusaders are themselves heavy smokers. 
and heavy drinkers. And uh, nicotine and alcohol are the most commonly available drugs in the world today. They are over-the-counter drugs. So the critics condemn the one while they indulge the other. And that's mental indulgence. Allowing with your head something you would never allow in your life. And that is hypocrisy. And it's the tragedy of the irreligious moral man. He is a hypocrite because he thinks what the immoral man is doing. And while this goes on, he sits in judgment on the immoral man. And so Paul takes the judge and puts him in the dock alongside the prisoner because both the judge and the prisoner, both the moral man and the immoral man are guilty in the sight of God. And in the rest of uh, Romans uh, chapter 2, Paul goes on to give the three disadvantages of uh, mere morality. And I'd like to uh, think of these three disadvantages now. Now, of course, there are advantages to morality. Morality can hold a family together. It holds society together. It holds a nation together. It holds a civilization together. Morality is the thing that makes men and women gel together in families, societies, cultures, civilizations. And in the end of the day, immorality is a destructive thing. Our own nation today has been destroyed by immorality because immorality destroys people. It destroys families. It destroys societies and nations and cultures. They fall apart because morality is the gel. But there are... Uh, disadvantages to mere morality and Paul points out three of them in uh, the rest of um, Romans uh, chapter 2 there's a disadvantage of spirit there's a disadvantage of the heart and there's a disadvantage of a uh, conscience first of all <coughs> disadvantage of Spirit or outlook. Paul says mere morality makes men presumptuous. Uh, Self righteousness without God or morality without God or being good without religion induces a man to be presumptuous. And a cut above the rest. You know the Pharisee's great cry in the Gospels when he stood in the temple to pray. And he said, I thank God that I am not as other men are. And that's the kind of spiritual pride and presumption to which um, mere morality can lead. Paul says in verse 4, Do you presume upon the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience. Mere morality leads to presumption. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered why God is so patient and so long-suffering with people who have no time for him or who ignore him year after year 
after year, God endures them and uh, still they live. Have you ever asked that question? In my last parish, I once buried twins <coughs> who had lived for one day. It was a wretched affair. Neither the father nor the mother, a young couple, had any faith at all. And uh, to make matters harder, they insisted on taking the wee things to the old family burying ground in Paisley. It was a grim, grey Lanarkshire morning, all soot and muck from industry. And the cemetery in Paisley was filthy and unkept, full of old vino bottles and all the debris left by the alcoholics. It was dreadfully, dreadfully depressing. And I asked, why? Why take these two wee souls who had scarcely opened their eyes to see the light of this world? While healthy, able-bodied, godless folk stravague the earth and prosper, why? Why does God do it? I also recall burying a nice young laddie of seven who had died of kidney failure. Those were the days when renal dialysis was still in the experimental stage and kidney transplants were quite unknown. It was a heartbreaking business going into Glasgow every other day to see the boy, watch him wasting away. And the question persisted. Why? Why this comparatively innocent life and other useless, godless lives are left to go on and on? Walk through the streets of our town latish <clears throat> on a Friday or a Saturday evening and see these well-fed, healthy, godless fellows wandering around from bar to bar, from the hayloft to Dillinger's, down to the crit, off to one of the discos. Their brains crazed with drink. And as likely as not, their hearts blazing with lust Why does God endure those who ignore him? Unless you think I'm being a bit hard on people who go to bars and discos, while these godless lads are roaming the streets, sitting quietly in respectable houses, sipping sherry or a glass of chilled Liebfraumilch, there are other people just as godless and just as irreligious and they have one thing in common with the godless fellows on the streets. They ignore the God in whose hand their breath is. Why is God so patient with the immoral and the moral? Who ignore him. And Paul says in verse 4, Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And that is why God waits. That is why God allows people who ignore him to go on living. He is waiting for repentance and that's why he spares sinners and spins out the years year after year after year he is waiting for them to come to Christ 
as the New Testament says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should turn to him and live. God is not willing that any should perish. The first disadvantage of morality is it makes men presumptuous. The second disadvantage is this. It tends to harden the heart. Look at verse 5. He says to the moral man, Don't you know that by your hard and impenitent heart you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath? Can I speak very frankly here and uh, very tenderly? I have found (coughs) that just about the most difficult people to win for Christ and the kingdom are the moral people who are trusting in their good works and their righteousness. The sort of folk and You know, the churches are full of them who cannot see the difference between decency and Christianity. And you often find that their hearts are coated with cement or with tar macadam. And it's very, very hard to get the word of grace and the word of Christ and the message of the gospel through the hardness to reach the heart. Did you know that in the late Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church used to speak about the treasury of merits? According to Rome, this was a kind of reservoir of good deeds up in heaven. And uh, this box of good works was accumulated over the years by the saints and all their merits and all their virtues were put together into the treasury of merit. And uh, somehow they believed that if you lived a good and a decent and a virtuous life down here, uh, somehow all that merit was accumulated for you in heaven, rather like uh, building up a healthy balance in a building society. And there are still people you know who think like that, that you can build up credit with God by being good. And of course, you cannot. You cannot please God by being merely moral. You cannot get to heaven by being merely moral. The whole Bible is against that. Because what morality often does is this, it hardens the heart against grace and against Jesus. And that's why so many decent moral people are the hardest to reach for the gospel. And uh, the third disadvantage of mere morality is this. It undermines the work of a healthy conscience. In verse uh, 15... Paul says, they show that what the law requires, what the Ten Commandments requires, is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. And conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them. And that's a verse that's very important because it brings out the twofold function of conscience in man. It accuses, but it sometimes excuses. It accuses when it points the finger at you and says, Thou art the man. And it excuses when it tries to find all sorts of reasons and rationalizations to explain away 
the wrong thing you've done. God said to Adam, What is this that thou hast done? Adam said, Well, you know, I'm not entirely to blame. There was the woman that you gave me, as if that was a fault. So God turns to the woman and says, Well, what's this? And she says, Well, it's not entirely my fault either. There was this snake in the garden. The conscience is there to accuse. But a man who trusts in mere morality will find that he has a conscience which excuses. I'm sure you've often heard folks saying, well, you know, my conscience is clear. I've always lived a good life. I've always done the best I could. I've always tried to help my neighbors and lend a hand when it was needed. My conscience is clear. But as is also said, a good conscience like that is often the sign of a bad memory because we forget the things we've done wrong. Way back in the past, years ago, the things that we shouldn't have said and the things we shouldn't have done. We forget these things and say, my conscience is clear. Do you know the story of the Christian man who was out for a walk one Sunday evening and he came across a farmer harvesting his corn and he said, Dear me, Hector, is that you taking in your corn on the Lord's day? Hasn't God given you six lovely days this week on which to get your hair in? And Hector said, Well, I seem to get on fine without God and his commandments. I work hard. I make money, I spend money, I eat well and I sleep well. What's mine is mine. My conscience is clear. It's Sunday night and all my accounts are settled. And the Christian said, God doesn't always settle his accounts on a Sunday. Your conscience can accuse you, but it can excuse and explain away wrongdoing. I would not like to think there was anyone here who was trusting in morals and goodness. According to Romans 2, trusting in morals and in goodness will give you three things. It will give you a presumptuous spirit. It will give you a hard heart. And it will give you a careless conscience that doesn't work. You see, Christ comes with the offer of something else. And what you need this morning is another kind of righteousness. A righteousness that comes from outside yourself and which has nothing to do with goodness. And what you need is the righteousness of God. And that comes by faith in Christ. And faith in Christ simply means that you open your hand and stretch it out in all its emptiness to be filled by God. And in that simple step of trust. God will make a new person of you and he will dress you up in something far more wonderful than morals. He will dress you up in the righteousness of his own son. Open your hand. <clears throat> 
stretch out your arm today and God will clothe you with gospel righteousness, with the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to his own word.